right, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. If you're a child in here and you would like to go to children's worship, now would be an incredible time for you to go that way. Off to my right, your left. All right, it is so good to be here with you this morning. We are finally finishing our 12 characteristics of a healthy church. Today will, in fact, be the last day that we do the 12 characteristics. So we made it through all 12. It might have taken us 15 weeks, but we made it. Next week, we will have my good friend uh, Justin Runyon from Emirates Baptist Church in Dubai. He will be here in person to share with us and, and preach for us next Sunday morning. So I'm so excited for that. And so, it, you know, you're going to get a good sermon for a change. It'll be great. And so please mark your calendars. Make sure you come next week. You will not want to miss it. What an incredible man of God who is doing an incredible work and just really just wants to share about the ministry there and share his heart. And we just get to take part in that to have him here today. So please come next week. Make sure you're here for that. But today we're going to do the 12 characteristics, and we're going to do part two of prayer. Like I said last week, this is not a second sermon. It's the same passage, Acts chapter 4. I just needed to break it up into two sermons because it was so long. I literally have 18 pages of notes on this one sermon. That's entirely too many if you didn't know. But nonetheless, we're going to get through this today. Acts chapter 4, I'm going to read this passage once again. Acts chapter 4, starting to verse 23. When they were released... They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, They were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Pray with me, church, over the reading of his word. God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful how it informs us, and I pray you would teach us this morning. Show us prayer. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been working on this essential question. This is going to be the same essential question that I asked last week. If prayer is so important because everyone would identify prayer is essential. It's an essential characteristic of the health of our church. But if prayer is so important, then why do we pray so little? Ian Bounds, if you remember the quote that I read last week, he identifies prayer, little prayer, as one of the great evils of our time. Now, like I said last week, I don't want to continue to beat us down and to convict us over and over and showing us that we pray too little. What I do want to show is just a pattern that Scripture gives us about prayer to hopefully encourage us on how we ought to pray and how Jesus taught us to pray and even how the disciples and the apostles in this moment continued into Jesus' model of prayer. And so last week we identified that there were six movements in the prayer. Essentially, Acts 4 is almost an identical replication of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. But the first three movements we identified were position, adoration, and submission. If you remember this, I'm not going to rehash the whole sermon. So if you were here, you remember it, and you've meditated on these words all week, and you just come ready for the next three. But if you weren't here, let me catch you up a little bit. The first movement is position, that our position before God changes. If you hear them call out, they say, Sovereign Lord, our Father who art in heaven, both of these prayers are verbally humbling oneself before God. They're establishing this correct posture between who they are and who God is. And we even see this, it affects not only our physical posture as we bow our heads or we're on our knees or we fall prostrate, but even the posture of our heart changes as we approach the throne of God. And then the next movement, the second movement was adoration. That there's time in this prayer that they spend literally praising God. 
And then let our, I'm sorry, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them? And then the, the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name. I think as we pray, it's essential to take time in order to praise God. And I said, you know, the chief end of man, we're created to worship. And prayer gives us this platform to worship God. And then the third movement there was submission. Submission to his will. This is praying your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is not so much about pulling God to my will, but really about bending my will to match the will of God. We talked about God is not a divine vending machine. But how often do we quickly jump to petition or request and we, and we treat God like this divine vending machine, A2, I need this, God, or we only go to God when we need these certain things. What's ironic is you survey these first three movements, not one single movement here is focused on petition. It's not focused on requesting or asking God for things. And then you survey our own prayer life. And like, I'm sure like me, convicted last week that the majority of my prayers are focused on requesting God for things, asking God for things. But hopefully you, like me, have been challenged through Scripture last week to see that our prayers need to change. The way we pray and approach God needs to change. God is a God who deserves our worship. He's a God who, who deserves our position to change before him. He's a God who deserves our adoration and our praise speaking to him. He deserves our submission and focus on his will and even praying for his will to come. Then we move on to the fourth movement where we're gonna, this is going to be new today. All right, the fourth movement that we see here, you see it on the screen, petition. Because as you're working through these three movements, you may ask a question, you may be wondering, so does this mean we don't ask God for things? I would say no. I think we do ask God for things, but please hear me out on this. Let's see if we can follow and see if I'm teaching on this right. I'm going to start at verse 29 there in Acts chapter 4. If you look at verse 29, it says, And now, Lord, this is what they're praying. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants. They're literally asking God for something in this moment. Grant to your servants. The mirror image of this in the Lord's Prayer, what does it say? Give us this day our daily bread. So hear me clearly. I'm not saying that we should not ask God for things. I think both of these verses reveal a pattern of petition. But hear me clearly. I am saying that if we humble ourselves before God and we spend time in praise and worship of Him, we spend time bending our will to his and praying for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. That pattern will greatly affect what we petition to God. Let's look at these two examples, the Lord's Prayer and in Acts chapter 4. What did they petition for? I think this is so crucial to see. In the Lord's Prayer where they say, give us this day our daily bread, daily sustenance. Our basic daily needs, not necessarily excess. Now, I realize we're humans. We have basic needs in order to survive and in order to function as humans. And I think it's okay to pray to God for those, to help supply those needs and to rely on Him to supply those needs. But I think there's a fine line between praying for what we need versus praying for our desires. And I think sometimes it's even hard to distinguish between the two. I don't know about you, but I want a lot of things. With the risk of embarrassing my kids, I'm going to keep this pretty light. But if parents out there, if you know this, like if you ever kids ever, have your kids ever come up to you and say, Dad, I, I want this. Or I, maybe they don't say I want. I need this certain thing. And I look at the certain thing that they need and I evaluate the situation. And I quickly come to this understanding that they don't really need this. They want it. And so we've got a famous saying around our house when this happens, we tell our kids, we need you to sleep on it. Because what I want them to do, I want them to evaluate whether or not this is actually a need or is it a want. Even if it's their own money. We, they, we drive them crazy, I think, when it comes to this. They're like, bad dad, it's my own money. 
I'm like, yeah, but I'm trying to help you think through, do you really need this? Let's sleep on it today. Come back to me tomorrow. And if you still think you need it, then we can talk more. But I think that same process there, when, I, when it comes to our prayers, I think needs to happen because we as a, a human creation here in, in our culture today, we have a hard time distinguishing between what we want and what we need. I need a new car. Amen? I need a new house. I, I need a, a job promotion. I need a Five Guys cheeseburger. Anybody feel me on that? <laughs> but what do we really need. Maybe we have a unique perspective because when we sold everything and moved to the Middle East, what we actually thought we needed, we actually didn't. What I would have said was a need before all of that whole experience, I look back now and look at it like that was silly. We didn't actually need that. There were so many things that we got mixed up between our needs and our desires. This last week, I was talking to Jerry. We have a, I have a video call with Jerry every week. We teach him the lesson that he teaches to the kids the next uh, couple days later. And so I was meeting with Jerry, and he wanted to see my new house. And so I was taking him the, the video around and kind of showing him my house. And it just, I'm telling you, I just want to be honest with you, it, it floored me in this moment. I was so humbled and convicted on what I needed. Because as I was sitting there talking to him, it was midnight. It was 110 degrees at his house at midnight. He sat there and had to have a rag in his hand and continue to wipe the sweat off. His shirt was drenched in sweat because they don't have air conditioning. And I'm sitting there showing him my house and the temperature is set on 74 degrees or probably not that, it's probably 79 degrees. I still have thin blood from Dubai. But nonetheless, I'm completely comfortable in my home and I see his situation. And for a, just for that split moment, I'm like, what do I really need? I think if we have a conversation with people like that and we see their situation, I think it becomes clear what we really think we need and what we want are two different things. So what is the substance of our petitions? What do we request God for? Are they focused on our daily needs or are they centered around our personal desires? Like I tell my kids, I'm trying to teach myself to go through this process, to sleep on it. Is this what I really need? Look in Acts 4. What did they petition God for? In Acts 4, they said, grant to your servants. They're asking God to grant them something. But what did they want? Grant to your servants to continue to speak the word with all boldness. They literally were praying for God to grant to them boldness to proclaim his gospel think about our prayers and our petitions, when is the last time that our petitions centered around on asking God to grant us boldness to proclaim His Word? If you've ever proclaimed His Word, you realize this is a difficult thing. Sharing the gospel with our neighbors, traveling to other places to share the gospel, it's an extremely difficult task. It's hard. I think this is a very vital prayer and a valid prayer to request God to answer this, to give us this boldness that we need to proclaim his gospel. So if you see this substance of their petition, it in fact centered around their personal situation, but it also reflected the accomplishment of God's will. So yes, petition, but may our petitions be informed by the will and the purposes of God. I know this is a unique perspective, and I had to really check myself this week to think, is this really what prayer is? Should prayer be like this? Am I being too hard, and I'm trying to evaluate this? And so I, I started researching and just reading all kinds of different people, and I came across a plethora of quotes, but I want to bring three to your attention today, three different men, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, John Bunyan, and John Stott. I want, to hear, I want you to hear their definitions and their perspectives of prayer just to know or just to help you realize that I'm not crazy. I know it's going to be hard to do, but I at least want to try to help make you think that I'm not crazy. This is what Bonhoeffer said. He says, if we are to pray aright, perhaps it is quite necessary that we pray contrary to our own heart. I didn't say this. This is Bonhoeffer, Okay. Not what we want to pray is important, but what God wants us to pray. If we were dependent entirely on ourselves, we would probably only pray the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, divine vending machine, right? 
But God wants it otherwise. The richness of the word of God ought to determine our prayer, not the poverty of our heart. Do our petitions reflect the richness of God's word or do they simply reflect the poverty of our heart? See, when prayer is only focused on our personal desires and our, and our personal circumstances, we get into this pattern of praying village prayers to a village God. This is a statement that, that John Stott created. I didn't create this, but village prayers to a village God. This has been stuck in my mind all week. This is what John Stott says. He says, I remember some years ago visiting a church incognito when we came to the pastoral prayer. It was led by a lay brother because the pastor was on holiday. So he prayed that the pastor might have a good holiday. Well, that's fine. I like good holidays. Pastors should have holidays. Thank you, John. Second, he prayed for a lady member of the church who was about to give birth to a child, that she might have a safe delivery, which is fine. Third, he prayed for another lady who was, who was sick, and then it was over. That's all there was. It took 20 seconds. And then I said to myself, it's a village church with a village God. They have no interest in the world outside. There was no thinking about the poor, the oppressed, the refugees, the places of violence, and world evangelization. So do our prayers, do our petitions, do they reflect our village or do they reflect the world? Are our prayers focused on the poor, the oppressed, the places of violence? All you got to do is flip on the news or, or scroll through YouTube a little bit just to see the stories of what's happening around our world to know that people outside of our circumstance right here need our prayers. People who we wouldn't even necessarily agree with. We don't agree with even some of the things that's happening around the world, but that doesn't mean that these people, the poor and the press, don't need our prayers for God to act on their behalf. So do our prayers are they village prayers to a village God or are they big prayers to a big God? But hear me, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for our circumstances. I'm just trying to help us understand that our prayers should be balanced. Let our petitions, let our petitions reflect not only our immediate needs, but let our petitions reflect God's will and His glory. If you think about it, you think, yeah, I need to pray for this because I want this or I think I need this. But have you ever prayed something and looked back and you thought, man, I really didn't even need that. I'm really glad that God didn't answer that prayer. For this one, I want to bring up the theologian Garth Brooks on this one. If you're familiar with, this, with these lyrics, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. It's this, it's this thought that, that really, if you think about it, even if, I'm, if I would stay here today and say, yes, you should pray for what you think you need and pray for what you want and pray for your desires, I bet five years goes down the road, you would look back to what you prayed for and you would think, oh, goodness, thank you, God, for not answering that prayer. So then it kind of really understands, like, do we even know what we even need? I think praying in this way helps us to understand that, that we're praying for God's will. He knows what is best. He can see beyond our circumstances. He can see the future. He knows what's good and what's right for us. I can think of my life on extremely silly prayers that I prayed growing up and even in my adult life that I look back and think, wow, that's embarrassing. So instead of completely embarrassing myself, I was speaking with my family yesterday on, hey, I need an illustration on something praying, praying for something really silly. And uh, Kai helped me out on this one. I had not heard this story before, but he read a missionary biography of Amy Carmichael, and he recalled a story from Amy Carmichael of how she prayed for something really pretty silly one time, but how God really used this. And so thank you, Kai, for helping me with my sermon this morning. But as a little girl, Amy Carmichael wanted blue eyes more than anything in the world. Her mother had always taught her that God answers prayers. So every night before bedtime, Amy would ask God to change her eye color from brown to blue. This was before the contacts, right? That would have made it a lot easier. Every morning, she would jump out of bed and run to the mirror and look in her eyes and see if God answered this prayer. But in fact, every time they were brown. So she could have been thinking, God, do you not care about me? I'm praying earnestly. I'm believing you for this. And yet I still have these brown eyes. 
Well, fast forward to her adulthood, and eventually she moved to the country of India to be a missionary. And a big part of her work was caring for and rescuing child, children out of prostitution. And in order to do this work, she had to disguise herself to look like a local Indian in order to rescue these children. She would rub coffee grinds on her skin to make her skin more brown. But yet for her eyes, if she had blue eyes, it would have been impossible because the blue eyes would have been a dead giveaway that she was, in fact, not a local Indian. You look at this circumstance and you think, well, did God not answer her prayer? Well, no, God didn't answer her prayer, but it was for her good. In fact, God had a plan for her one day that was going to require her to have brown eyes. I know that's a a story from years ago, but I think the same applies to our situation. Even when we ask for things, even if God doesn't grant those things, just know maybe he has a different plan for those things in our life. He knows what is better, even when we cannot perceive it. Last guy I want to bring up is John Bunyan. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, I would encourage you to read that. It's a neat book. In 1663, this is not a new idea. This is what I want to try to show you guys. I'm not coming up with something new and innovative. No, this is a very old idea. Look at how John Bunyan defined prayer in 1663. See if this is reminiscent of anything that we've talked about. He says this, prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of our heart or soul to God, right? Pouring out our heart and our soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit. What are we pouring our hearts to God for? He says this, for such things that God hath promised or according to his word for the good of the church with submission and faith to the will of God. You see how you define prayer? It's a pouring out of our heart to God to ask him for the things that he has promised in his word for the good of the church in submission to his will. This is not a new idea, church, and I hope you hear me. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for your circumstances, but as a people, as I surveyed my own prayer life, my prayers need to be different. They don't only need to focus on my circumstances, but I need to pray to God about the more circumstances that are outside of my personal village. Let's look at this. What do we got here? This fifth, fifth movement here is confession. Fifth movement, two more. Fifth movement is confession. In Acts 4, they say, while you stretch out your hand to heal. And then more clearly in the Lord's Prayer, it says this, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Confession. Admitting that we are wrong is not something that comes natural to us. You guys know this, right? I shouldn't even have to bring this up probably. But if you ever like got, you know, called out or something, or you're like somebody's trying to perceive that you're doing something wrong, what naturally comes up? All kinds of excuses, right? I am the world's best at excuses to make sure that it's not my fault. Anybody else can join me out there? Like we just naturally have this, this mechanism built in to our lives that we can make excuses for everything in order to ensure that it's not our fault. But this next movement is literally focusing on ways that we are not right. <laughs> and admitting to God where we fall short and confessing our sins to him. Isaiah 6, for some reason, has meant so much to me over the years. I know I referred to it a lot, and I'm sorry. I'm probably going to refer to it many more times. But Isaiah 6, and I think about this confession to God. I think about Isaiah 6 because Isaiah was, was good. He was chilling, and then God brought him to, to reveal to him this vision of seeing him on his throne. And so Isaiah was brought before the throne of God. And if you, if you look at the response of Isaiah, immediately, immediately when he saw God in all of his glory, You know what Isaiah said? I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's what Isaiah saw. And that's what Isaiah saw about himself when he beheld the majesty of God. I thought this often, that our depravity is best seen in the light of God's majesty. 
So if we can behold the majesty of God, it will lead us to confession because when you see God for who he is, you really see who we are and our need for confession. So may our prayers before the throne of God, if we follow this pattern of of changing our position, spending time in praise, submitting to his will, may they lead to confession. But think back to our prayers. How many of our prayers, how many times do we spend in dedicated time to confessing our sins to God? How many times do we even spend in, in just quietness asking God just to reveal where we are falling short, asking God to show us, God, where, where are we falling short of your glory? Show us the sins that we have, the hidden sins of our heart, and then even waiting for God to reveal that to us. I know we think we have it all together, and I'm, I'm not saying you, I'm, I'm bringing myself into this equation. I hope you understand that. So many times we want to think we, we have it all together and these prayers don't reflect the heart of confession. D.A. Carson says this, uh, Mason sent me this quote, so I appreciate this, Mason. Give him some props on this. D.A. Carson says, the people of God are furthest from reformation and revival when they are smugly content, like the church of Laodicea. There is hope when by God's grace, they writhe in agony of honest confession. And check this out horribly aware of the insidious and pervasive power of sin in their lives and their culture. You see that how that reflects even Isaiah. So may our hearts be open to understand how far, how far we fall short of God. But in that grace and forgiveness, let our hearts be led to praise for this forgiveness that he offers on our behalf. But realizing this heart of sin and realizing this need for confession, I think is the pattern of Scripture. When I thought through this, I thought about Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's written three-fourths of the New Testament, incredible man of God. When I look at his life, I'm like, wow, this is incredible. What a guy. But what does he say about himself? He calls himself the chief of sinners. He even says in, in Romans 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. See this heart that he's crying out that I'm filthy before you, God. My righteousness are as filthy rags before you, God. That's the heart posture that people are coming to the throne of God with in Scripture. And then Jesus even tells a parable in Luke that I, that I read this week, and I thought it's so, so crucial for us to see this perspective of prayer. Jesus said it like this, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, Thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I have and all that I get. Is that the posture of our heart? But look at the other story. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You tell me, church, who do you want to be? Which man in this story do you want to be as you approach the throne of God? May we enter in with a heart of confession and a heart ready to admit where we fall short so that we can be led to praise him for the grace and the forgiveness that he has offered us. And it's only through him that we can stand. And once we are fully aware of who God is and how we fall short and meditate on his forgiveness and offer, the only thing I think that we can offer at that point is praise. So may our hearts May our prayers consist of confession. Sixth movement. All right, you still with me? Last movement. We made it through all six movements of this prayer. And the sixth movement, it's going to be pretty short here. It's exhortation. It's kind of a churchy type word, exhortation. But if you notice, all of them end with a shun. I usually don't do that. I feel like Wes up here today. But we did it, okay? All right, a pleading, this exhortation, it's a pleading 
or an urging. That's what this word means, a pleading or an urging. It's strongly encouraging or urging someone to act, calling to one's aid. So in this last movement, they're pleading and they're urging for God to do something. In Acts 4, they end with a final exhortation, pleading and urging God to act on their behalf while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And in the Lord's Prayer, what does it say? And lead us, their, their final exhortation, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus taught us to plead with God to act on our behalf, to lead us away from temptation, to deliver us from evil. In Acts 4, the apostles pray for God to act, to heal, and to perform miracles so that his word and his truth could be proclaimed even more. These urgings and these pleadings in Acts 4 and the Lord's Prayer, they're different, but they're still ending with this call to God to go before us, act on our behalf to do your work and to do your will. So six movements, I'm going to flash them on the screen here. This is where we come to today. Position, adoration, submission, petition, confession, and exhortation. I believe this is the Scripture's pattern when it comes to prayer. I believe this is how Jesus taught us to pray. But as you're surveying this, there may not be much application at this point. Okay, the question was, you know, the essential question talked about little prayer. Why do we pray so little? How can this sermon or these sermons really increase our prayer? How can it help us develop a consistent prayer life? I want to bring in a little bit of application to this point. It's going to get really practical. The theology is done. Now we're going to get to just like the, the meat and bones of it and how this applies to our life. I think, first of all, we in our culture, even myself, we don't know how to pray. So hopefully over these last two, two sermons, we've at least seen a Scripture's pattern that gives us how we can approach God and how, or how can we pray. What are the things that we should be praying about? And then secondly, I think we, we don't develop this consistent prayer life because we don't even have a plan to pray. I know many of us, some of us may not be planners, but majority of us in here, I would say that we are planners. We stand by the conviction of our planning, all right? Whatever we do, it's going to be planned out. When do you ever just say, all right, you load up your family in the car, you're like, okay, kids, wife, or vice versa, whatever, let's just get in the car and let's just go somewhere, Okay, Dad, where are we going? I don't know. We're just going to go. We're going to get in the car. We're just going to start driving. Where are we driving? I don't know. But when we get there, we'll know. When would we ever do that? My kids would look at me like I'm crazy. My wife would not get in the car with me probably. It's like, no, I'm staying home. Thank you very much. But when it comes to our spiritual life, that's exactly what we do, isn't it? We get into this vehicle of prayer and we just go for it. We have no idea where we're going, where it's going to lead, what we're trying to accomplish. There's no plan involved. And I think that leads to an inconsistent prayer life. And then when we do finally find the time to pray, one of the hindrances that comes up is distraction. You guys ever get distracted in your prayers? Maybe it's just me because I have ADD, but I resonated with, with R. Kent Hughes' uh, statement on this. I want to read it from his book, The Disciplines of a Godly Man. He talked about this on praying and distraction. He says, essential to our effective petitionary prayer is a prayer list. And I'm going to, this is what I'm encouraging. This is what we're going to be building towards is the actual prayer list. But he says this, I say this first because of my own repeated experiences. For example, I may be praying for my mother. And as I pray for her, I see our old family home at 747 Admiral Avenue. In front is parked my gray premier 1941 Ford. It has racing slicks on the back and hopped up 48 Merck engine. And on the side, custom pinstriping that reads, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Suddenly, I am 17 wearing my blue suede leather jacket, sitting behind my gold steering wheel and heading down Beach Boulevard to Huntington Beach. I can smell the ocean and the cocoa butter. So much for my prayers for my mother. So what I'm advocating this morning is a prayer list to help defeat and to, to help defeat this, this evil of distraction, to give us a plan and a pattern to pray for, and then to develop how we ought to pray. And I'm not saying this is the only way to pray. Hear me. This is not the gospel way to pray, okay? That this is the only way. 
There's other ways to pray, but if you're out there and you need help, I would advocate this as a method to pray for, to literally take these six movements and set a prayer list up based on these six movements, to go through and fill in some of these with some bullet points on how you can pray through each movement. I think, do I have another slide? I can't remember exactly. Okay, yeah, flash this, this last slide. Just kidding, I don't have it. All right, go back. Okay, good. So a prayer list, how this could look, let me just quickly uh, say this. Uh, position, spending time, dedicating our time to changing our posture before God, to slow down, to recognize God for who he is, and then move on to giving praise to God. Write some of these praises down if you want to. Praise God according to his greatness. Bring up scriptures in this time. Write scriptures down that you want to pray back to God. Look through the Psalms. They, they speak praises to God. We can actually speak God's words back to him in this moment. Praise him for his provision. Praise him for his grace. There's so many things. The song that we even let out with this morning is praise. There's so many things that we can praise God for. Write them down. Carry them with you. And then move on to a dedicated time of submission where you're actually praying for his will to be done. Dedicate praying for his kingdom to come. Pray for your will to be changed and molded to reflect his. And then spend time in petition. But as we saw, may our petitions not only be focused on our personal circumstances. It's okay. Pray about your family. Pray about the grieving. Pray about the ill. Pray about important events, present problems informed by God's will. Pray for the, also the poor, the oppressed, the refugee, the lost, and unreached people. Pray for missionaries and pray for boldness in evangelism. Don't let your petitions be village prayers to a village God. Let them be more. And then confession. Spend time confessing. Ask God to reveal these wrongs. Confess our sins. Be willing to admit our depravity. And then finally, end with this exhortation. Plead with God and urge God to act in certain ways and in, in according to your circumstances and how he can accomplish his will through your life. I think I put this on your sermon sheet. That's where it was. It wasn't on the screen. It's on your sermon sheet, I think. And I left some space there that you can use this as a prayer list in your life. And like I said, again, it's not the only way to pray, but if you need a God, if you need a plan, if you need to help defeat this distraction, use this in your prayer life. Church, as we come to a conclusion here, I've been so burdened over the last couple of weeks just on the power of prayer. I've been so burdened even in my own life about my lack of prayer, my misperceived perception of what even prayer is. So I bring this to you as one who is just humble before you to say, church, work with me. As I learned to pray all right, because I think it's so important for the health of our church. If we are to sustain a movement here at First Baptist Church that brings honor and glory to God, that impacts this community, it will only come through prayer. We have nothing to offer, but God working in us can use us in an incredible way in this community. But it comes through the vehicle of prayer. I want to end with one final story. It's about Charles Spurgeon. If you don't know much about Charles Spurgeon, he's perhaps one of the most famous preachers of all time. He was even nicknamed the Prince of Preachers. Thousands gathered every Sunday to hear him proclaim the Word of God. The reach of his ministry is unfathomable. Tens of thousands of people have come to know who Christ is through his ministry. So people would come to hear Charles Spurgeon, and then they would stay over and they would want to tour the church, the beautiful sanctuary um, in England. And they would want just to, to try to catch just a few moments with Charles Spurgeon to ask him, Spurgeon, what is your secret to the success of your ministry? So he would show them the church and he would give them a tour of the campus. And then always at the end of the tour, he would say, do you want to see the boiler room? On Spurgeon's day, the bullet room was the, was the place for the power. It was all revolved around steam engines, and it was the source of the day. And as he would tell these young preachers and these young men visiting him, would well, you want to see our boiler room? They're like, why would we want to see your boiler room? It's nasty, it's hot, it's dirty, it's in the basement usually. Why would we want to go down there? And as he would take them down to the boiler room, what they found there was an empty room in their basement, not of boiler room equipment, 
but filled with a hundred people in dedicated prayer for their church. And he looked at these young ministers and he said, this is the secret to my success. He says, my people pray. Church, as I think about First Baptist Church, the success of our church will come through our people praying. So may we be a people of prayer. Let me close with us in prayer. God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for your word. God, it humbles us, it challenges us. God, I pray you would convict us this morning. Make us a people of prayer. So that when they look back and they see all that is happening here at First Baptist, they will know, God, that it is coming through this vehicle of dedicated prayer. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.